Good morning. How you doing? Hope everybody's doing fine today. Today is Sunday, February 13th, 2022. This is the online Sunday school lesson for Aceville Baptist Church out of Anderson, South Carolina. Before we get started today, let me ask you to continue to pray. Uh, prayer works. Uh, we've had several uh, testimonies how God was able to work in several people's lives. But uh, I still have a, uh, several family members and uh, friends and church folks uh, that have asked me to continue to pray for them. Uh, pray for this uh, COVID thing, this flu thing, this strep thing, uh, that God will uh, soon relieve us of, of all this stuff and we can get back to a normal way of life. Pray for comfort for those suffering bereavement. The Lord knows each need. Uh, again, our list was long Wednesday night at prayer meeting, uh, but we got several friends and families around us uh, that need uh, our comfort and our prayers. Pray for our church. Pray for our church leaders uh, that they'll be God-filled and want God to be closer to them uh, so that our church can grow. Thanks again to our special services last Saturday night and Sunday morning. Thanks, Preacher D, for putting that together, but to hear from one of our missionaries was just absolutely awesome. And I use the word awesome uh, when I speak about something that God has done. Uh, that's the only time I heard a preacher say that the only time to use awesome is when you're talking about God. Well, it was awesome service uh, because I believe both services were of God. The title of today's lesson is Trust is Exhibited. Uh, the explanation that the teacher's book give is that believers can trust God in all circumstances. Uh, the story of the day comes from Daniel chapter five, Daniel six, and I'm gonna give you uh, some background to it. Uh, it's one of those stories that I remember as a child. Uh, I'm sure you've heard preachers preach it. You've heard Sunday school uh, teachers teach it. Uh, I still remember, and, I, and I've shared this before, Miss Mary Dean, uh, my young, a uh, five and six year old Sunday school teacher used to keep those pictures on the wall and every week we'd have a lesson, she'd flip and find a picture. And I can still remember the picture uh, of the lion's den. But yeah, we're in the story of Daniel and the lion's den today. Uh, I believe this happened. Uh, it's in the Bible, it's true. But today's introduction comes from our commentary, uh, which uh, was written by Janice Meyer. Uh, a member of Hickory Hollow Baptist Church in Antioch, Tennessee, where she teaches the adult Bible study. Now, my plans are, I'm gonna try to contact this lady. Uh, this is commentary this year, uh, or this quarter has been fantastic. And I think it, it, it's been fantastic to me because of course I'm a common person and I wanna hear real live stories uh, that help, uh, uh, help you with the Sunday school lesson. And I think with her being a Sunday school teacher uh, at a small church in Antioch, Tennessee, just makes these stories even more real. But in her introduction today, she talks about a fellow by the name of George Mueller. Uh, George Mueller was a German evangelist uh, that lived during the 19th century. He once said he spent 75 of his year, years of his life walking just in close fellowship to God. But he also said, my life didn't start out that way. Although he says he got saved at 14, in real life, he was constantly getting involved in worldly pleasures. By 16, he was put in jail as a vagabond and as a thief. George's father uh, wanted him to become a preacher. So he sent him to study at a divinity university uh, of Hall, H-A-L-L-E, uh, and in German, that may be Halle, Halle, or something like that. But I'm going to say Hall for this introduction. While there, a friend invited him to a meeting at the home of a friend of a Christian. That experience and the time he and his friend spent that night kneeling in prayer changed his life. You see, from there, his life changed dramatically. During the rest of time at college, he took a personal oath not to take any more money from his parents for schooling or for anything he needed, but he decided he was going to trust God to provide for his every need. George prayed about everything and expected God to help him. As a result, 
He finished school. His challenges in life produced even deeper trust in God. Muller moved to England in 1832, where he and his wife opened an orphanage. This became his life's primary work. George faithfully depended on God and saw himself as only a steward of God's provisions. The orphanage grew and grew and grew to where records indicate he had cared for over 10,000 orphans. Yet he never asked for support and never went into debt. Instead, he prayed in return, God supplied all the resources, all the finances he needed to do the work at the orphanage. Muller learned he could trust God in all circumstances. I've learned that I can trust God in all circumstances. Today's lesson shows us how Daniel learned more and more, like Muller, to trust God in all circumstances and that God would always be faithful to those that trust him. The background for today's lesson, and I feel like this is important because, again, this week, the Sunday School lesson starts right in the middle of the story. Well, I'm going to try to give you the beginning of the story. Uh, after last week's lesson, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was restored back to the king of Babylon. He had learned to trust the God of Daniel. History tells us that after he took over, back over as king, that King Nebuchadnezzar ruled Babylon and he died in 562 BC. In fact, it told me, as I learned and studied this week, uh, that he died in October of 562 B.C. He was succeeded by his son, Ami Marduk. Now, don't forget, Marduk was that false god that Nebuchadnezzar had first, uh, first worshipped and built the idol for. His son ruled from 562 to 560 B.C. You say, that's only a couple years. That is correct. Until the people began to overthrow him, and in 560 B.C. actually murdered him. Amai Mar Marduk, King Amai Marduk, is assumed to have been the son of Nebuchadnezzar and overtook the throne of Babylon in October of 562 B.C. when his dad died. Now look with me at Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Again, I'm going to try to bring you up to this week's lesson that takes place in chapter 6. So let's look at the first five verses of chapter five there. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, the king, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was at Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and the gods of silver, the gods of brass, the gods of iron, the gods of wood, and the gods of stone. In the same hour, now get this, came forth fingers on a of a man's hand and wrote against the candlestick upon the plaster on the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand and wrote. Again, God decided to prove to the king that was ruling that he was God and God alone. This king had a dream. This new king had a dream here in verses one through five. He had a party. He allowed the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem, God's vessels, to be used in a drunken party for his gods, and I say that with a little g. Verse 5 says he got drunk, had a dream, a dream of a finger writing on the wall. Now, I ask you this morning, as we've been studying the last few weeks about Daniel, guess what? He wanted his dream interpreted. Who do we know that was given the power to read dreams? Yes, we remember from chapter one, Daniel. So he called in Daniel. Daniel, interpret my dream. So look with me at chapter five, verses 18, 19, and 20. 
O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father's kingdom, a majesty and glory and honor. And the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him, whom he would show, and whom he would keep alive, and whom he set up, and whom he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed for his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. You remember the story last week, how it was, God actually turned him into an animal for seven years, but then he was able to see what and how powerful Daniel's God was. And he restored him back to his kingship. Now turn with me to Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar has died. His son Belshazzar has taken over as king. In verses 22, it says, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart. Thou knowest all this. And now you, King Belshazzar, have a hard heart like your father had. You have a hard heart against your captives, the Israelites, and all the people you rule. And you've used God's vessels to throw a wild party. Well, something's about to happen. Let's look at chapter 5, verses 24 through 30, which is toward the end of the chapter there. Then was a part of the hand sent from him, and Daniel's interpreted the dream now him, and this writing was written on the wall. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tickle a parson. This is the interpretation of the dream, I say. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and will be given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the new kingdom. As Daniel interpreted a dream, he told King, King Belshazzar that your kingdom is going to be divided and you're going to be overthrown. What happened? Look at verse 30 and 31. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. He lost his life. And Darius the Median of the Medes took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. As Daniel interpreted the dream, verse 30 says that that night Belshazzar was killed. And the next day, and Darius the Median of the Medes took over the kingdom, and he was 62 years old. Now look with me as we get ready for today's lesson. In chapter 6, in the first two verses, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over all these, there were three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. King Darius now delegated his rule. He gave rule to 120 princes, who were then ruled by three presidents. Of these three presidents, one was given to Daniel. Daniel's role was honorable. The other president's role was dishonorable, and they despised Daniel. In fact, they devised a plan to get rid of Daniel and take over his part of the kingdom. Look with me at chapter 6, verse 5. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They figured that they could not find any fault in Daniel. His life was followed after God. He followed God and God's laws. So they couldn't find any fault in him, and they figured if they were ever going to trap him, they had to find something wrong or about his God. They figured they could do nothing against Daniel unless they found something against Daniel's God. Now turn with me to Daniel chapter 6, verses 7, 8, 9. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree 
that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. We have the plan now. The teacher's book this week called this section, this scripture, The Trap. The other presidents devised a plan that everyone for 30 days would not be allowed to petition their gods or any man for 30 days. And if anyone found guilty of praying or petitioning their God, they would be thrown into a den of lions. So these presidents, without Daniel knowing anything about it, went to King Darius and had him sign a decree. King Darius trusted his presidents. He signed and sealed the decree without even reading it or understanding it. Now, Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did beforehand. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee. O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was so displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the sun going down to deliver him from his bondage. The commentary says by this time Daniel was probably in his 80s. As one of the presidents, he most likely had a two-story house. Most likely the small upper room being higher up was very hot at times, so he would open all the windows. So Daniel, as a customer, would go up to this upper room and pray while facing in the direction of Jerusalem three times a day, every day. Most likely morning, noon, and in the evening, he prayed. Is our prayer life as dedicated as that? The commentary made a note I want to share also. Most likely, Jerusalem had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar when he overtook Judah in Jerusalem. Why did Daniel still pray toward Jerusalem three times a day? It's most likely, and it, uh, it, the commentary said, it still symbolized where God was, the presence of God. On this day in these verses, Daniel knew the decree had been signed, but Daniel, even in his 80s, had learned to trust God in all situations. The events of Daniel took place around 539 BC. Daniel had been praying that day three times a day. He had been praying because God had been faithful to him and he was not going to change, even if it meant his life. He went to his room, opened the windows, and began to open the window toward Jerusalem. And I say, amen, brother. He began to pray to God toward Jerusalem. Toward his God, he began to pray and ask God for supplication and to take care of him and to let him continue to trust him. Now look with me at Daniel chapter 6, verses 11, 12, and 13. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed the decree that every man shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days? Save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. 
The other men and several of their leaders went to Daniel's house and found him praying. In fact, the scripture says Daniel was imploring his God. They had caught him. He was making supplications before his God. The hostile spies lost no time in reporting what they found. They went straight to the king immediately. And I can hear it now. And this is Johnny's way of saying it. Oh, Daniel up yonder went to King Darius. Darius, Daniel broke your dec decree. He's still praying to his God. We just caught him doing it. Daniel prayed to his God. Now, King Darius, do as your decree says. Of course, that's making a little bit of uh, uh, word is there, but I think they were so happy they had caught Daniel and they couldn't wait to tell King Darius that Daniel was praying to his God. Then verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with him and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. When King Darius heard this from the reporters, he felt very displeased. He had trusted Daniel to be a leader and he always could be trusted. Dan Darius was angry at himself. He was not aware he had signed such a decree. He did not want to punish Daniel. This verse says he worked till sundown to find a way to release Daniel from his guilt. He worked till sundown to find a way to release Daniel from his guilt. I ask you today, and we all know, who else worked till sundown to find a way to release us from our guilt? As believers, we too need to be like Daniel, ready for a time when God will call us to stand for him, even when it means standing alone. In Bible times here, I learned this week that Babylonians and the Medes and Persians, they required punishment for crimes to be carried out on the same day that the crime was committed. So by sundown, King Darius could not figure a way out for Daniel to be released. Then what happened? Verses 15 through 18. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established can be changed. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasted. Neither were instruments of mustic or music brought before him and his sleep went from him. The commentary said that this Daniel opened windows led to the Daniel's door being shut. Daniel's open windows led to the lion's door being shut. The other presidents and spies went to King Darius. Darius is guilty. You, the king, know he's guilty. Punish him. Put him in the lion's den, they said. Having found no way out for, for Daniel... Darius sent Daniel into the lion's den at dark. For information only now, unlike the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace to kill, it, to kill them, King Darius was a Mede, and they worshiped fire as a god. I, I found this quite interesting. Therefore, instead of throwing people in the fire, King Darius threw people in the lion's den to kill people that were guilty. As a last-ditch effort, King Darius went to the lion's den and spoke to Daniel, May your God, whom you continuously serve, rescue you. Daniel chapter 6, verse 17, 18. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. And with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. 
A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the lion's den. The king then had chains and locks put on the stone to lock Daniel in. He even sealed the lock with the, with the signet from his own ring. This meant nothing could be changed now. So Daniel was in the lion's den. The king went to his palace. Usually he would have a fancy meal and a fancy drink and drink fancy wine. Then he would go to sleep by music being played in his room. However, this night, because he was so troubled and because he could not save Daniel, he fasted and could not sleep all night long. Daniel chapter six, verses 19 through 23. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, serve the living God. Is thy God whom thou servest continue able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me or as much as before him innocence was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no matter of hurt was found upon him because he believed, and I'm gonna add, and trusted in his God. I love this part of the lesson. Uh, it just seems to bring justice to the whole story. At the first light of dawn, King Darius rushed to the lion's den and went and he cried out to Daniel with a loud voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God saved you or rescued you? And guess what? Daniel spoke and hollered out, yes, Daniel, he was alive. May the king live forever, he says. Daniel tells King Darius that his God has sent an angel to keep the lion's mouth shut. They have not harmed me. In fact, they have not harmed me at all. It was custom in that day that if the person that was thrown in the lion's den survived the night at the first light of day, if they were still alive, they would be released. The king gave orders then to take Daniel out of the lion's den, let him go free. As they looked at him, he had not been harmed. The king was overjoyed. Now Daniel chapter six, verse 24. And the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children and their wives and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. According to Medes tradition, you sow what you reap. King Darius went to the lion's den at the crack of daylight. According to tradition, if one being punished survived the night till dawn, he could be freed, found not guilty, free to go. But get this, but the law also stated, your accusers must now face the same punishment since they caused the guilt. Since Daniel was saved and found not guilty, someone must face the punishment for the guilt. At Darius's command, all the other presidents and their spies and their entire families were thrown into the lion's den to face the guilt that they had caused. The Bible says they had not reached the bottom of the pit before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Today, as we look at this lesson, we ask ourselves, what can we get from it? In the New Testament, there was a man that was hung on a cross he was hung on a cross for no reason whatsoever, just like Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. This man went to the cross for my sins and your sins. He died on that, an earthly death, and he was also resurrected to atone for my sins and your sins. He gives me grace and mercy each day to live every day, and I, because of that, I live every day thanking him for giving me the day. 
For you see, I'm not guilty. I follow the true God, Jesus Christ. My Lord has set me free. He set me free. He took the guilt upon his back and went to the cross and stayed till dark because of my guilt. Because of that, I will follow him is the song that pops in my mind. I will follow him. I will trust him. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this lesson. Though it be a lesson from our childhood that we remember so well, it's always good to read it. And, and even as an older adult now, I still get much from it. I realize that staying true and faithful to God and trusting him in every situation will always come out for his glory. We pray that the people listening today will get this story. And even though it may sound like a childhood uh, story from our Sunday school days, that they will get something afresh from it today. Lord, we pray for those that are sick, Lord. We pray, we pray so hard every day, Lord, please help these people. Help our country to refresh ourselves back to following you. Help the leaders of our church to refresh themselves to back to following you. In all the activities of the church, may we give you glory as we come to each service. Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meeting. We pray thy blessings upon every service, Lord, and that you'll forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our hearts. We thank you for these people listening, Lord. Bless them. Help them have a good week, Lord, and we'll thank you at all. For it's in Christ's name, amen.